Grace is God's unmerited favor for us, his crazy love. And the truth is, many times we struggle understanding it. If you find yourself struggling to understand God's grace, don't beat yourself up. Even the disciples struggled with understanding grace. Jesus, is that you? You're alive. I can't believe you're alive. Okay, I was in the boat and I wasn't catching any fish, okay? But I heard this voice and the voice said, cast your net to the other side. And so I'm thinking, I'm a fisherman. I know what I'm doing, but I'm not catching any fish, you know? And so I throw that net over there and then a gaggle of fish pop into that net and I'm going, this is a total miracle. Who could have done that? I need to know who told me to throw the net to the other side. And boom, I look up and I mean, there is you. You're looking at me on the seashore going, it is I, the Lord, and you're alive. I can't believe you're alive. <laughs> this is awesome. Andrew, get out of the boat. Come on. Peter, yeah. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. I love you. You're alive. This is so great. Good. And, then feed my sheep. Andrew, get out of the boat. Come on, man. It's him. Peter. Yeah. Do you love me? I love you. Yes. And I'm so sorry about that rooster cluck, and I had no idea what that meant, but I do now. I'm better for it. All right. Okay. Good. Then feed my sheep. Andrew, I'm smiling, but I'm serious. Come on, get out of the boat. It's him. Peter. Yeah. Do you love me? Jesus, mere words cannot describe the passion that I have for you. I love you. You know everything. I love you. Good. Good. Then feed my sheep. I didn't even know you had livestock. That is so like you, though. There's something new about you all the time. That's what I love about you. Peter, yeah. do you remember uh, the morning the ladies went to the tomb? Yeah, 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 yeah. We're all in the upper room trying to figure out what to do next, you know, because we thought you were dead. You know, you were dead, you know, and we're trying to figure all that out, you know. And Mary comes running up, and Mary's like saying, beehive, beehive, beehive. And I'm thinking, I'm allergic to bees. Like, keep them out. You know what I'm saying? But as she kept getting closer, I heard her correctly. She was saying, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive. And we're going, who's alive, who's alive? And she said, she was at the tomb, and the tomb was empty. And she said that the, there was an angel there. And the angel said, go tell the disciples and Peter that everything is okay, he is risen. And so me and John, we hightailed it down there. And if John says he beat me, he's totally lying, all right? I beat him, FYI, all right, you know? And we get down there and I'm looking in that tomb and it is, it is empty. There's nothing in there, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, what does this mean? What does this mean? And John is right there. John is so good with words. He should write a book. He is so good with words. And John said, don't you get it, Peter? This is everything Jesus said he was going to do, and you did it, and it's done. Let's go. This is so great. Wait, yeah. the angel said what? Uh, go tell the disciples and Peter that everything is okay. He is risen. You've risen. Let's go. This he is said what? Go tell the disciples and Peter. Go tell the disciples and Peter. You said my name. Why did you say my name? Peter, that's grace. No, no, I don't, I don't deserve that because that night people kept coming up to me asking me if I belonged to you, if I was with you, and I kept denying you left and right, all right? No, no it'll take me my whole life to make up for what I did. It was unforgivable for no, what I did. No, What I did on the cross was meant to take what is unforgivable and make it forgivable. That's my grace. It's not about you. It's always about me. That's grace, Peter. Good morning, everyone. Please stand to worship.
I've carried a burden for too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let it all go. I see it now, I'm laying it down, and I know that I need you. Run to the Father, I fall into grace, I'm done with the hiding, the reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend, so I'll run You ready for church? Come on up. Good morning. Ella, 
So we're going to be talking today, I've been talking a lot about what some of the bigger kids are doing, but today we're going to be talking about what the littles have been doing, um, the toddlers and pre-K. So in the beginning, in the beginning, the first book of the Bible in Genesis, God made all things. Right, Audrey? God made, God made all things. Do we remember what did God make? He made the sun. Do you want to hold that? It's very important. And older kids, you can kind of chime in on this too. What else did God make? The moon and the stars. Do you want to hold that one? So God made the sun, the moon, and the stars. He also made water. That's right. Paisley, you want to hold that? God also made mud. <laughs> when, it's, when you add water to it, it becomes mud, but God made the ground. Do you want to hold that one too? Yeah. And where does the plant come from? How do we grow a plant? Yes, Ryan. The, the ground. Elodie, what do you, or Audrey. <laughs> I confuse the two. Audrey, where does a, how do we make a plant? With the ground and seed. So God makes seeds. So in Genesis chapter 1, I'm going to read the first couple verses from it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So before God made all of these things, did it sound like a beautiful earth? It had nothing. There was nothing except the heavens and the earth, and then the Spirit of God. So there was darkness everywhere, and then the sun came, and then all of these other things came as well. Now, if we were to, so if we took away the sun, would we have plants? No. If we took away, <laughs> if we took away, here, you can have the sun back. You can have the sun back. If we took away the seeds, would we have fruits and vegetables? No. So all of these things we should be thanking God for. God made all of these things. And then older kids today, we're going to be wrapping up the Ten Commandments. There's going to be a song and hopefully a game that we can do at the end. So why don't we fold our hands and pray before we go back there. Let me fold our hands and pray. Dear God, thank you for everything that you have made for us. We thank you for everyone here. We hope that everyone has a safe trip home. Some of these kids are going to camp next week, and we're very excited. They might be feeling nervous as well, and we just hope that your guidance and your strength is with them always. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, why don't you walk as, as many steps as you can without running? With, there you go. Hi. I'm really loud. How is everybody? Yeah, good. It was a busy week. Everybody else feel like it was a busy week? We skipped announcements on purpose. I'm just going to read through them here real quick before we get started. Uh, we had the 4th of July service at Pell's Park on the 4th of July. It was really good. We had, I think I counted about 100 people. Uh, you guys were most of them, so thank you 
for uh, always supporting the stuff that we do. Uh, Carrie and, and two of the girls are at NYC right now in Tampa Bay. They're coming back this week, so really excited to hear their uh, firsthand experiences uh, about that. I've been watching online, and it is an incredible, incredible thing. Um, I wish I was in that room right now. Uh, Paxton Pool, we were going to have swimming last night, uh, but um, there was some concern with the weather. They normally close the pool if it reaches below 70, and it was going to teeter around there, so we decided to postpone. So the new pool time is uh, July 29th, and then again on August 5th from 6 to 9 p.m. So July 29th and August 5th will be at the pool. Uh, kids camp's coming up. July 13th through 16th, and Teen Camp is coming up July 17th through the 21st. July 30th is All Church Youth Group at 6 p.m., so come hang out with the kids and play games and eat food. Anything else going on? Did I miss anything that we want to talk about? No? Great. I'm down 65 pounds today. Um... I'm, I was really excited about that this morning. So my first goal was to get under 300 pounds, and I'm at 300 pounds this morning. So uh, I will hit that this week, so I'm really excited about that. Uh, yeah. How are you, Gabe? Miserable. Miserable? Oh, well. Let's change that. Okay? Oh, that's right. I heard you talking about that. Gabe has poison ivy. So. Yeah, everybody give him a hug. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good morning. good morning. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to John 20. We're going to dive into a pretty good passage where we'll explore the power of the Holy Spirit, the encouragement of Jesus, and the promise of faith. So as we go down this road, I want to look at the words of a Christian author, A.W. Tozer, who once said, the world is perishing for lack of the knowledge of God, and the church is famishing for want of his presence. So we want and we need Jesus. We also need the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in the church. With that in mind, let's, let's, uh, let's open with a word of prayer, actually, this morning. Father, thank you for this beautiful day and the, the opportunity to come together as a church. Uh, to learn from you. We ask that you would open our hearts, open our minds, help us to find the truth in this passage, help us to fully grasp the power of the Holy Spirit, the encouragement that we receive from Jesus, and the promise of faith that you have given to us. Let your presence be felt in this place today as we, as we grow closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's dive into this passage as we hopefully discover some life-changing truths. So we're going to start in John 20, verse 19. It says, On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said, Peace be with you again. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So the power of the Holy Spirit is, is a central theme in the New Testament and a, and a foundational aspect of our Christian faith. So in this passage from John, we see Jesus breathing, physically breathing on his disciples and telling them to receive the Holy Spirit. So this act of Jesus breathing on them is, is symbolic. It's symbolic of, of the same life-giving breath that God gave to Adam in Genesis so we can experience the fullness of life and faith through the power and ministry of the Holy Spirit. So the role of the Spirit in the lives of believers is, is kind of multifaceted and it's transformative. So first, the Holy Spirit 
Uh, where are we at here? The Holy Spirit empowers believers for ministry and service. In Acts 1.8, Jesus tells his disciples, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So the Holy Spirit provides the necessary power and the boldness for believers to share the gospel and serve others in the name of Jesus. So this power, it's not limited to the original disciples, but it is available to everybody who believes. So for you and I, we have access to the Holy Spirit, which is the same power that gave Jesus the ability to overcome life and death. So secondly, the, the Holy Spirit guides believers in John 16, 13, Jesus says, But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he'll guide you into all the truth. So the Holy Spirit helps us to understand God's word and apply it in our lives. So as we're reading the Bible, it helps us to discern what God is saying. He reveals the deep things of God and illuminates our minds to grasp the truths of Scripture. So this guidance is essential, and it's 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 essential for spiritual growth and spiritual development and spiritual maturity in our lives as it enables us to, to discern God's will and make wise decisions in our daily lives. So the Holy Spirit produces spiritual fruit in the lives of believers as well. In, in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, we read, but the fruit of the Spirit is joy, love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, all the good stuff. So these qualities are not, they're not produced by, by human effort, but they're a result of the Holy Spirit working in and through our lives. As we, as we kind of yield and, and submit to the Holy Spirit and allow Him to, to transform us, we start to exhibit these, these Christ-like characteristics which ultimately bring glory to God. It helps sanctify us. Fourth, the Holy Spirit intercedes for believers in prayer. In Romans 8, 26 and 27, Paul says, In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. The Holy Spirit helps us to pray effectively. Even when we don't know what to say or pray for or how to express our deepest needs, how to express our desires, if you are afraid to pray, all you have to do is practice and the Holy Spirit will help you get where you need to be. He intercedes on our behalf, ensuring that our prayers align with God's will. Fifth, the Holy Spirit serves as a seal and a guarantee of our salvation. So in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, Paul writes, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives is a confirmation of our salvation and a guarantee of internal inheritance in Christ as long as you follow him. You have to follow him and you have to interact with that relationship to have that guarantee. This assurance enables us to, to live with confidence and hope, knowing that we are secure in our relationship with God. And lastly here, the Holy Spirit helps believers to, to live holy and sanctified lives. 1 Peter 1-2 says, "...chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father." through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with His blood. So the Holy Spirit works in our lives to bring, to bring salva, uh, sanctification, which is the process of becoming more like Jesus in our thoughts, in our words, and in our actions. 
That's the simple, simplified definition of sanctification. Becoming more like Jesus in our thoughts, our words, and our actions. As we submit to the Holy Spirit's work in our lives, we experience ongoing transformation and growth in holiness. It's a very central part of the message of the Church of the Nazarene. The power of the Holy Spirit is, is really remarkable, honestly. As we reflect on the various aspects of the Holy Spirit's works in our lives, we should be filled with gratitude, I think, in awe at the incredible gift that God has given us. The Holy Spirit isn't just a, a concept or a force, but is a personal, powerful, and life-changing presence in the lives of those who believe in Jesus. And I know he's real because I'm standing here today. If it was not for the Holy Spirit, I would be probably in shambles. The encouragement of Jesus is it's a vital aspect of our Christian walk. As it serves as a reminder of the, the, the love and support and, and the guidance that our Savior provides for us. In the passage from John 20, 19 through 23, we see Jesus appearing to his disciples after his resurrection, offering them peace and encouragement in the midst of their fear and uncertainty. It's a powerful example of how Jesus continues to encourage and strengthen us in our own lives, even when we face challenges and difficulties. He does this through his, his faithful presence. He is always near. So in this passage, Jesus appears to his disciples when they're, they're gathered together, they're locked away in fear of the Jewish leaders. And despite their fear, Jesus comes to them and stands in their midst, offering them peace and reassurance. So this demonstrates that Jesus is always with us, even in our darkest moments when we're trying to lock ourselves away from the world, providing comfort and encouragement when we need it the most. Christian author uh, Corey Ten Boom said, There is no pit so deep that God's love is not deeper still. That is a huge quote. There is no pit so deep that God's love is not deeper still. Another aspect of, of Jesus' encouragement is the affirmation of it, his identity. In John 20 20, Jesus shows his disciples the, the wounds in his hands and on his sides, providing, proving that he is indeed risen. He is the risen Lord. So this act not only confirms the truth of his resurrection, but also serves as a reminder of the sacrifice that he made on our behalf. By showing his wounds, Jesus encourages his disciples to trust in his victory over sin and over death and to find hope and strength in the knowledge that he is the conqueror of the grave. So furthermore, Jesus Jesus' encouragement extends to his commissioning of the disciples as well. In verse 21, he tells them, As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. So this statement not only empowers the disciples to continue Jesus' mission on earth, but also reminds them that they're not alone when they go do it. Jesus is sending them out in his authority, with his support, ensuring that they have the resources and the guidance that they need to fulfill their calling. This commissioning serves as a reminder to all believers that we're called to share the good news of Jesus with the world and that we have his encouragement and his backing as we do this. So we should never be afraid or feel like we're alone. Jesus' encouragement is also evident in his gift of the Holy Spirit. In verse 22, Jesus breathes on his disciples and he tells them to receive the Holy Spirit. This act, uh, it signifies the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit in the lives of the believers and it equips them with the necessary gifts and the, the abilities to carry out their mission. So the Holy Spirit serves as a constant source of encouragement, providing guidance, wisdom, and strength as we, as we navigate our Christian journey every single day. So the encouragement of Jesus is kind of multifaceted, uh, it, and it's a concept that encompasses his presence, his affirmation of his identity, his commissioning, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. So as believers, we can take comfort in the knowledge that Jesus is always with us, 
no matter what, providing the encouragement and support that we need to face life's challenges and fulfill our, our own calling. So as the theo- theologian and pastor Charles Spurgeon once said, the presence of Jesus is all the heaven we desire. The promise of faith is evident in the passage, John 20, where Jesus appears to his disciples after his resurrection. This, this fulfilled promise of his return is not only for the disciples, but it's also for all believers who put their faith in Jesus. It's important to understand that faith is it's not merely a mental assent to a set of doctrines or beliefs. Faith isn't just believing a certain thing or a certain set of rules or, or standards, but rather it's, it's a living and an active relationship with Jesus, who is the Son of God, who has conquered death and sin. It's an active and close relationship with Jesus. So in this passage, when Jesus appears to them, he brings peace and assurance, showing them his hands and his side as, as evidence of his victory. So the encounter with the risen Lord, it ignites their faith, and it transforms them from a group of frightened individuals into bold witnesses for Christ. Then Jesus commissions the disciples to continue his mission on earth, saying, as the Father sent me, I am sending you. So this statement reveals that the disciples are not only recipients of the promise of faith, but also active participants in God's redemptive plan for humanity, and so are we. They're entrusted with the, the responsibility of sharing the good news with Jesus, of, of Jesus' life and his death and his resurrection with others so that they can also experience the power of faith and the forgiveness of sins. The promise also includes the gift of the Holy Spirit, which Jesus gives to the disciples in the passage. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity and serves as a helper, a counselor, and a guide for believers in their walk with Christ. The Holy Spirit empowers the disciples to to carry out their mission, equipping them with spiritual gifts and providing them with wisdom and discernment needed to navigate the challenges of life. So the presence of the Holy Spirit in the lives of believers is a testament to the reality and the promise of faith as it confirms that Jesus is indeed alive and actively involved in our lives, even today. So this promise is not only a source of comfort, or it should be a source of comfort and hope for believers, but it's also a call to action. It invites us to participate in in God's redemptive plan for the world, just like the disciples. So it is also our commissioning. As followers of Christ, we're called to embrace the reality and the commission of Christ so that we can experience this fullness of God's presence and power as he, as he works directly through us. So as we close today, I want to take just a second to reflect together on, on the moment described in, in the John 20 passage. Jesus entered into a scene of fear and confusion as the disciples were still likely processing the events of the crucifixion. Jesus came bearing peace. He came with encouragement. And maybe, maybe most important of all, he came to offer help and a path forward because they didn't know where it was going from here. They didn't even know that they were going to make it through the night. He breathed new life in the Spirit over the disciples. And at the same time that the Jewish authorities were breathing threats of death and, and condemnation, Jesus offers life, hope, forgiveness and salvation he offered it then and it's available to us now so if you happen to be standing in the midst of of a difficulty and we will be at some point in our lives or standing in the midst of confusion or standing in the midst of a really scary season in your life receive the holy spirit Draw closer to the Holy Spirit so He can draw you closer to God. Receive that power and that promise and the the purpose of your salvation that was given to us directly from Jesus. You are not 
alone in whatever it is you're dealing with. Let's pray. Father, thanks so much for bringing us together here again today. Thank you for, for being with us as we, as we travel this life. Thank you for allowing us to, to not be alone and to have the ability, once we come to know you, to realize that we will always have somebody to lean on through the hardest things that we have in our lives. I know the Bible says that you'll stand at the door and knock and wait for us to invite you in, but sometimes, as this passage showed us, you'll barge in and you'll just be with us even when we don't know we need you at the time. Thank you for that. Thank you for always being available in the midst of our uncertainties, in the midst of our trials. We love you and we thank you and we give all this to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's stand and worship one last time, you guys.
Okay. <laughs>